Hello, I'm Joel Blackford with Beth Hassett Sabbath Fellowship at 1631 Ford Parkway. We meet every Sabbath in St. Paul from 11.30 a.m. to sunset. We'd love to have you join us sometime. You know that I ponder things and I ponder things and I've been pondering for many, many years which generation shall not pass. Yeshua speaks these words and they're written in all three of the synoptic gospels and I've always wondered which generation and why. So let's look today without twisting the Bible, without studying fake prophecy. We want to study the real prophets, and then we want to understand the news as it pertains to today and determine which generation is what and what is Yeshua talking about. So this generation shall not pass away until all these things are fulfilled. Well, that's Matthew 24. And so did the Bible get it wrong or do we just misunderstand the generation? What is this fig tree generation? So we're going to be talking about figs. It relates to Israel, but 1967 Israel, 1947 Israel, which generation, what generation, and what's the fig tree generation? So let's talk about it. There are many different trends out there. There's the generation of 20 years, 40 years, 70 years, 100 years, maybe even 120. 1897, the first Zionist Congress got together. That's 120 years ago, plus two. <laughs> it's 2019, 2020 actually, right now. Uh, 1917, the Balfour Agreement, agreement well, plus 100 years, and we're right about here. 1947 or 48, the 70 years. 1967, 50 years. The wars ended in 1977, and we had peace till about 2017. So we figured everything was going to kick off around 2017. Plus, we have these jubilees. 1867 seems to be a jubilee year. 1917, 1967, 2017. And we had something big happen in 2017, but it's not big like Yeshua returning. So we don't understand what's going on. Are we are we waiting for another jubilee? That's another 47 years from now. Well, that's a long time to wait. Or are we waiting for some other sign? So let's look at the signs and let's let's see some of the patterns that we know about because I'm a patterns researcher. The one pattern that's always been intriguing to me is the nine-year pattern. So all of these 40 eclipses, 10 of which were blood moon eclipses, and, and everything is equidistant. Everything is beautiful like a menorah, and everything points to the middle, which is the big four of 2014-2015, the, the blood moon tetrad during those years of 2014-2015. But nothing happened in 2014-2015, and nothing really happened at the end of 2019. So we're a year past that, if not more, and nothing's really happened. Um, and so now, I want to mention another pattern. It's a nine-year pattern, just like the menorah pattern. And this is when Rome came in and destroyed Jerusalem on Av 9 of 70 AD. Well, if you go exactly nine years forward to Av 9 of 79 AD, the second largest city in the Roman Empire, Pompeii, was destroyed by Mount Vesuvius. And that's nine years exactly to the moment. And it was a sudden destruction. And the people knew they were Sodom and Gomorrah because that was the sin city, the Las Vegas of the Roman Empire. That's where people went to have that kind of sex. So I was listening to Sad Who's Under Severage. Whether you love him or hate him, I love him. Um, you may not agree with me, but that's fine. Um, the main thing he said, there's that gap year. There's just a year in there. And so we're going to find those verses today and match them up with some other prophetic verses and see what you think. So now I want to also point out one more time again how the blood moons of 2018 and 2019 were all on the fruit day, the, the day you plant trees because you're going to get fruit in about five years. You know, um, you're not supposed to eat the fruit right away. So we'll ch check out the Torah for that. But I just want to point out one more time. Oh, and also it's 152 years since the last time we had a super moon, blood moon, you know, all these big things. Uh, and, and so um, let's, let's look at it then. 2019 minus 1866, the last time this happened, is 153 plentiful fruitful years, fish-like years. And we've really had the gospel spread in these last 153 years. So here's the blood moon eclipse of 121.19, another two Shabbat. And so that's another fruitful time to plant fruit <laughs> trees and to um, collect the fruit from those trees, which would be like planting the word of God in people and having it bloom. And, and so I'm making the comparisons between the 153 fish, which is the end of John, and 153 years, and all the, I, I think it relates to the 
fullness of the fruitfulness, the fullness of the Gentiles. And Paul would state it, the Melo HaGoyim, in, um, uh, that would be Romans 11. That's a paraphrase from Jacob blessing his sons Ephraim, who is plentiful and fruitful, and Manashe, the cross-headed blessing from Genesis 48. So there is this weird comparison between fish and fruit and, and, and blessings and time frames. There's that 153. And there's a reason why, oh, intriguing too, Ha Pesach is 153. So there's all sorts of interesting meanings that relate to this 153. So let's look at the verses that Yeshua states, and these are from the Synoptic Gospels, so that means they match each other. So we'll just read from Matthew because it's basically the same as Mark and Luke. Now let the fig tree teach you its lesson. When its branches begin to sprout and the leaves appear, you know that summer is approaching. In the same way, when you see all these things, you are to know that the time is near, right at the door. Yes, I tell you that this people, is that the Jews? I don't know. Will certainly not pass away before all these things happen. So that's Matthew 24. Same as Luke 13, 28 through 30. And it's the same as Luke 21. So it's very similar there. But who... And, and sprouting leaves and, and, and all of these things. Now, I have a very intelligent friend named Aaron, and he said, Joel, you don't understand. In the Greek, he's, spe he's speaking in the Hebrew, and in the Hebrew, this is all rhyming. So summer is a kuf and a zadi, and then a, 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 a yud in the middle, so that's a that's a, a kaitz, and branches are katsirs, and end is kates, and harvesters are ketzers, that's the angels, wrath is ketzef, and awaken is yaketz, and so it's all just kuf zadi these with other letters and he's just making kuf zadi rhymes but i think it has to do now it, that would be 190 i don't know what that happens to mean kuf is 100 and it's a monkey zadi is 90 and it's righteous um but it is a rhyme there's no doubt about it from matthew 24 and luke 21 and 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 from mark also there is a rhyme going on in all of this but i don't know what it means so let's find the rules first let's always go back to the basis of the rules which is in leviticus 19 and when you come into the land and you shall have planted all manner of trees for food and you shall count the fruit thereof as forbidden three years shall it be forbidden to you and it shall not be eaten and in the fourth year all the fruit thereof shall be holy so it's given to the priests for giving praise unto the Lord. But in the fifth year, may ye eat of the fruit thereof, that it may yield unto you more richly the increase thereof. I am the Lord your God. So the rule is that you wait until the fifth year. That's a long time. So now let's go to Yeshua in Luke 13 and say, A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit but didn't find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, Here, I've been looking for fruit on this tree for three years. That's plus so this is probably the fifth year, sixth, seventh, eighth, maybe the ninth year by that time, without finding any. Cut it down. Why let it go on using up the soil? But he answered, sir, leave it alone one more year. I'll dig around it and put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good. If not, you will have to cut it down. That's fine. Okay. So there's that extra year that matches up, and it's in three spots. So here's another one. Um, if you get married in Deuteronomy 24 or 5, you get one year to enjoy your wife and your family and everything like that and, and build your house and things like that. So you're not to go out to war for one year and to enjoy your life after you get married. And then here's another one. Um, uh, the tree that thou sawest which grew was strong. And uh, now this is from Nebuchadnezzar, and this is from Daniel 4, whose height reached up to the heaven and the sight thereof to all the earth, and all came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of 12 months, one year, he was walking upon the royal place of Babylon. The king spoke and, and said, Is not this great Babylon, which I have built for a royal dwelling place by the might of my power and for the glory of my majesty? Well, <laughs> exactly at that moment. He turned into a beast and he ate uh, uh, grass and he, his hair grew on his body like feathers. So that's that dream that you see where he's the lion, he's Babylon, but he becomes like an eagle because he, his hair is like an eagle over his body. So he gets one year to repent and he becomes even more egotistical. Okay. Now we're going to move on from what we've learned about sweetness and Torah and fig trees and things like that from the New Testament. We're going to talk about some, some rabbinic commentaries. They believe that when you sit underneath a, a fig tree, 
you're really supposed to be reading Torah. This is how it's always been. So uh, there's a Christian, there's a rabbi underneath the fig tree, both reading the Bible differently. Um, but the, there's figs off to the left-hand side. And so uh, there's a sweetness. Let's find it in the Bible. So Yeshua saw Nathaniel, which is gift of God, coming towards him and remarked about him. And so it's like salvation, seeing the gift of God coming toward him and remarked about him. Here's a true son of Israel, nothing false in him. And Nathanael said to him, how do you know me? Yeshua answered him before Philip called you when you were under the fig tree. I'm arguing that he was reading Jacob's dream in Torah. And I'll tell you why in a second. I saw you. So the gift of God said, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Yeshua answered him, you believe all this just because I told you I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than that. Then he said to him, yes, indeed, I tell you that you will see heaven open and the angels of God going up and down on the son of man. Okay, that's definitely from Jacob, from his dream. Yeshua is saying he's the Siloam, that ladder up to heaven. And, and so I think Yeshua caught him reading under the fig tree, reading Torah. And, and it's really an interesting interplay between the two of them as he was caught. The gift of God was caught reading Torah under the fig tree, but that's what people did. So let's continue on and just look at the, the opinions of this. So according to this man, Eden's tree of knowledge of good and evil was a fig tree, and the tree of life was a date palm. This is from Walter Reinhold Martig Batfield, and he, he's a smart man. Okay, the Bible suggests that some commentators that the tree of knowledge of good and evil may have been a fig tree. The clue for them is the Bible statement that after eating at the tree of knowledge of good and evil, Adam and Eve realized that they're naked, and thereupon sew together aprons or loincloths made of fig leaves to cover their nakedness. So you'd grab whatever's closest to you. Well, that would be a fig tree. When the woman saw that the tree was good for eating and delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable as a source of wisdom, she took of its fruits and ate. She also gave some to her husband, and he ate. And the eyes of both of them were opened, and they perceived that they were naked, and they sewed together fig leaves, which would be the first thing they saw, and made themselves loincloths. Hmm. A grassroots, so this is my argument here for this, from Yaakov Natan Lawrence. A grassroots spiritual movement is sweeping through the Christian church around the world. It's a new phenomenon. The movement is not well-defined. It's rather organic. I'm part of it. To label it would be to mischaracterize it. It is likely the most notable spiritual event to occur within the Christian church since the charismatic movement some 45 years ago. This phenomenon is referred to as the Hebrew moves, roots movement. I know some of you think of it as a cult, but it's too organic. It can't be. There's no leaders. There's nothing, there's nothing that ties the people together. These are all just the house churches uh, or the Messianic Israel movement. Unlike the Jews for Jesus movement that started about 30 years ago with the goal of bringing Jews into the Christian church, the Messianic Israel movement involves Christians returning to a Hebraic expression of Christian faith. Hmm. This movement is neither monolithic, oh, definitely not, it's not well organized, nor is it being orchestrated by any denomination or any group of leaders or any cabal of individuals. Or There's no leader. It's like pushing jello, as I always say. It's strictly grassroots and the result of spontaneous spiritual combustion in the hearts and minds of Christians. Okay, like me, I don't make sense in the Messianic movement. I'm a, a, the son of a godly Methodist pastor. I mean, a wonderful, wonderful man. And for me to leave those roots behind and move on to Sabbath worship doesn't make any sense. And for me to study Torah, but I didn't have any choice. I mean, it was horrific in 2006, 2007, and I had to figure out what in the world happened to me. And it led me to Torah and Sabbath and other things like that. So um, we've left the Catholic Church because we're back on the Sabbath. And otherwise, there is that connection to the Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church, not to say that it's evil, but there's something about it changing the day from Sabbath to Sunday just because they could. They had the power to do so. Um, and so we're becoming more like first century Messianic Jewish believers. Um, we're believing like Yeshua and the disciples from the book of Acts. So let's continue on. When King Shlomo compared Torah to the fig tree, he conveyed an important message about gaining and retaining Torah knowledge. So this is from a rabbi, and he quoted uh, Rabbi Yochanan uh, as to why the comparison was made. Just as one constantly finds figs when he approaches the tree, since they do not all ripen at the same time, there will always be some available for eating. So you would want to read Torah under a fig tree because you'll always have something interesting to read. And that's what I've come back to. 
Um, I read in the Hebrew now, and I didn't years ago, and I'm learning something new every single year that I read the Torah, uh, something amazingly new every year. So, too, you will always find a new taste in the Torah when you're studying. Very interesting. So, if this message about gaining Torah knowledge is derived from the compassion, comparison rather to the fig tree itself, there's another message from the words of this passage regarding the protection that a fig tree yields fruit prior uh, for its protector. One who sees a fig tree in a dream, says our sages, it, it is a message from heaven that his Torah knowledge is retained and protected in him. Interesting. Okay, so um, I'm arguing that the fig tree generation is renewed Torah study. The fig tree conveys the double message of gaining Torah knowledge by appreciating the new thrill which comes with every step of learning and the need to retain and protect that knowledge through through constant review so that we can enjoy the fruits of our study even if we are not lucky enough to see a fig tree in our dreams. So this is from um, Beth Gentleman. So continuing on, this is from Emil Hirsch and uh, the fig tree and its fruit are designated by Hebrew as the ta'ana, and uh, it's used frequently throughout scriptures. Uh, it's, it's Semitic, and um, let's see, down near the bottom here, uh, the figs ripen in August and form the largest crop. The early figs appearing in March and April and ripening in June are called the bikara, so the bikarim, the, the, the firsts. Okay, in the revised ver version of this word, in accordance with its etymology, the uniformly rendered uh, first ripe fig, the early fig is considered a great delicacy by the Hebrews. The late fig is not so much. Uh, they ripen later on. They, they can be rather bitter at times. Um, Bethphage, near Jerusalem, that's an important city in the Bible. Uh, that's alluded to the place of green figs. Uh, the term kites uh, is, is after the summer, the, the harvest of fruits. So it's, it's, it's fruitfulness. It's, it's like the fish again. It's like the figs. It's like reading Torah. It's all the same thing in the Bible. The fig was one of the most principal fruits of Palestine, even before the entrance of the Hebrews into the Promised Land. Fig, it's one of the seven. Uh, the seven uh, of the most important fruits in the land. Um, and so fig leaves are mentioned as the material of aprons for Adam and Eve, which is interesting too. The fig leaf is associated with an emblem of, of peace and prosperity. Uh, failure of the fig crop and destruction of the fig tree were regarded as mis misfortune and a punishment of God. So it's just interesting. Uh, it's the fig tree. So figs in the Gan Edan. Let's go back there and try one more time. So this is a midrash. Tell of Noah taking dried figs and cutting and cuttings into the ark. Rabbi Abba says Noah took dried figs with him, and Rabbi Levi says Noah took in with him fig cuttings. The fig is the first fruit tree mentioned in the Bible in the story of Adam and Eve. Yeah, that's true. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. The Jewish Bible commentators held that the tree of knowledge in the Garden of Eden was a fig. And what was this tree of which Adam and Eve ate? Rabbi Yossi says it was a fig tree, a fig whereof he ate the fruit, opened its doors and took him in the fig leaf, the leaf which brought remorse to the world. The Babylonian Talmud uh, has this, the tree of which the first man ate, Rabbi Nechemiah says, it was the fig, the tree of knowledge, the thing wherewith they were spoiled yet, where they were dressed by it, and it is said they stitched a fig leaf. Uh, and the non-canonical book of Adam and Eve, I sought a leaf to cover up my nakedness and found none, for when I ate, the leaves withered. Interesting. As always, I believe that we're moving forward. I believe that we are in a time of waiting. I think we're in that one year time frame. I don't know when it starts or ends, but sad who mentioned that and it got me thinking that we are in a time. Guys, the signs, the patterns just don't match up. I believe that we have entered into the seal three in 2012. We're ready to hit seal four. We're looking at wars in many different locations across the world. We've seen martyrdom, it's picking up again. Um, look at the skies now, too, because you'll see burning figs coming down and more earthquakes, too. So be aware of what's going on. And that's the end of the video. So thank you very much for your time and be blessed. Good night.